This video is the first video in the series of four videos which should be discussing the stage-by-stage -stage transformations that this boy went through. So let's go through the details. Again, the opening pictures, they are the ones describing the maximum level of support, or let's say the level of the support that the channel needs to maintain a position. You can see that my arms are, or my hands are placed in the chest area. So that's the level of the maximum support. I'm at the upper chest. Actually, as the evolution, what do you want to see? We want to see the level of support, sort of the circumference of support, gradually descending downwards. Because the true seating, the true independent seating, like edge seating in, our, in this particular test, would be the one when the channel would not need any of those levels of the support and we have sufficient seating platform to rely on and sufficient counterbalancing above it in order to be able to control his position. Obviously, over here, we're not seeing any of those. So that's the maximum level of support. And another important aspect of this is the general reaction, right? This is a very, very typical hyper extension, right? So you see this combination of fold forwards when the child is relaxed and arch backwards when he tightens up and tries to do something. And of course, please note this characteristic position of his arms, right? And this is the position of his arms, which is being present not only throughout the sitting, but throughout the other placements as well. So this picture actually is very, very typical as well, right? I'm actually providing even greater level of the support. I'm supporting this boy at the shoulder girdle level, above the chest, right? And even with that, what we're seeing, the head helplessly drops backwards. What I want to highlight now is this fact that those were the views of sitting and the limitations of sitting. But even once we look at his overall performance in supine position when he's lying on his back, well, one doesn't have to be a clairvoyant to understand that his sitting would be very, very limited, simply for the reason that he doesn't have the fundamentals. He doesn't have the selective mobility of the arms. His arms are stuck. His head is stuck. His entire body, you know, is a single unit. And this is another really important picture where you can see the hidden component, the component of the compressional weakness. And as I already mentioned before, he was very uncomfortable in any position, not only in the testing placements, and now, once we got through the background and the fundamentals behind it, I hope that this is easier to understand. Complete helplessness. And as I change the direction of the movement, we can see this rigidity. Very important nuance. You see, if you look at the legs, if you look at the trunk, if you look at the arms, and if you look at the head, what you're observing, you're observing that all of them stayed in the same fused position as before. None of them moved anywhere specifically, neither in counterbalancing nor even dropping. So you see this position of the head, this is not strength. This is fusion. This is lack of movement. So what do you want to see? We want to see developing mobility and then on top of the mobility and then building strength. So I'm moving to a different direction. This is the tests which are rotational. Rotational tests clearly show the same picture, the same story. As I do the moves, head, trunk and the legs, they all move simultaneously. There is no angular difference between them. A very simple thing to understand. Without angular difference, how could this boy deliver physically any adjustments, any counterbalancing? It's simply impossible, right? Like, like the car with the wheels that don't move cannot adjust, right? Cannot really be driven, even if you put a best driver in. So that's 
the very straightforward philosophy behind the ABI approach. And you can see when I move him by the legs, it's exactly the same story, right? Everything moves as the unit. Please watch the position of his arm, right? It doesn't change throughout this entire movement, right? I move him about, say, 90 degrees, and throughout this entire movement, the arm position remained completely unchanged. And the view from the back is very, very informative. You can see that flatness, flatness, nothing really like no shapes, no contours, nothing meaningful. Everything just kind of mashed together. And you can see as I move him, no counterbalancing at all, at all, just a single block. Whether I move him to the right or whether I move him to the left and that's another zoom in and this is another highlight of what i was just talking about no space for movement no room for movement between the actual rib cage and the pelvis and as you as i highlight here no meaningful platform to sit on he just drops he sits on a single tiny point well obviously with all these limitations it shouldn't be a surprise that he can't do much. And these rotational tests, the limitations of the rotational tests, confirms this once again. This is the view from the side, and those of you who are the parents of quadriplegic children, I believe you're going to recognize this, right? This folded chest, dropped head, and when the boy is being moved forwards, what we are seeing, we are seeing incredibly important thing. Lack of mobility in the lumbar region. If we follow it closely, we would see, please look here, right? As I do the movement, the back line doesn't change. Nothing transforms it. See, he stayed equal, the same curve and the same position of the pelvis, the same position of the head, whether he was sitting sort of straight or he was moved forward. So that's lack of mobility. And this is a zoomed in, like a more detailed view into this deficit and the challenges that he experiences with the support by one arm. And you can see here, I'm helping him with the support, with the suspended support of a single arm, but this is his stronger arm. And please note here that as the arm is being moved, I apologize for the gray image, it's taken from the video, but you can see how the entire trunk is being dragged with, as a unit. And again, you can see this helpless collapse of the body. So the head has to be movable selectively. This is not the case here. You see, as I just brought the head backwards and let it go, I didn't do anything challenging. You see what I've done, I've just brought the head backwards. And if there weren't any limitations within the neck, what would have happened? The head would have stayed. But what is taking place here? The head springs forwards, shoots like out of the catapult. And as I repeat it, whether he's in the good mood or in the bad mood, that's what happens. You can see this is very important picture, right? As the head is being moved, the arms are being dragged. And that's what we emphasize. These are the two components. First of all, segmentation, Second, development of the strength. Together, they give the weight-bearing control. And only on top of this weight-bearing, the specifics of voluntary function could develop. And the last but not the least component is the seating platform itself. Without the proper seating platform, it is impossible to control the position. If the child moves, then basically what happens is any muscular reaction immediately just throws the child off right and i guess it's easier to understand that sitting on the sacrum sitting on the back of the pelvis is simply unrealistic because that's impossible to get the balance so these are the key elements to remember and i hope that got a good overview of it so that as we go to the next stages, you'll be able to follow the steps and the transitions that this boy has been experiencing. Thank you.
let's proceed to the next part.